I Shavua Tov. We are here in the nine days. We're here in the nine days of Av, very reflective time in the Jewish calendar before we enter Elul, another reflective time before the high holidays. And very excited, session number four. Session number four to learn with you all. If you're new to this program, we're going to do um, about 15, uh, 20 minutes of, uh, of sharing, and then we'll, we'll move towards conversation and, uh, and questions and thoughts. So thank you all for being here. Great to see a lot of regulars and, uh, and a few new folks as well. So we are up to Me'amar, Me'amar. The Malacha of Me'amar is concerned with the concept of gathering, particularly the gathering of produce or the bundling, bundling of sheaves. Once again, connected to the totality of the agricultural experience. Now, what's interesting in this stage of the process is that produce has moved from the ground to its ultimate use. And by this time in the agricultural cycle, the farmer is engaged in gathering what has been harvested. The farmer is, or hopes to be, close to seeing a profit since the crop is now being prepared for the marketplace. The Midrash warns us of the moral dimensions of this final stage. This Midrash is from the Tan Chuma, Tan Chuma, Mishpatim number 10. Here's what it says. It's like the case of a man who had brought a sheaf of corn, which he placed upon his shoulder, and then walked in front of the donkey who was longing to eat it. But what did the, what did the owner do? When he reached home, he tied the sheaf high above the donkey so that the animal could not reach it. People said to him, you cruel man, the animal has been running the whole day for the sake of the sheaf, and now you refuse to give it to him? So it is with the hired worker. The whole day he has been toiling and sweating, hoping for his wages, and you send him away empty-handed? And so now there's this interesting question about, um, about economics as to who has the rights to the gains, to the profits. The animal who's involved, the day laborer who's involved, the one who's made the larger risk, taken the larger risk in regards to the enterprise. And this is one of the great, the great political debates. In fact, um, I think it was Amartya Sen who gives the the, the case of a village. You find a flute in the village. It sounds like it's from the Talmud, although they don't have flutes back then, I assume. So when does the flute get invented? No, they have, maybe they have flutes back then. Yeah, of course there's flutes back then. That already, already by uh, much earlier. Okay, so um, what, what's the case? They find a flute in the village and three children make a claim to the flute. Famous, uh, famous case among economists and political theorists. One person says, I made the flute. It's my flute. I made the flute. The other one says, I am the only one who will never be able to afford a flute. And the third says, I play the flute the best. So who should get the flute? The one who can make the most beautiful music for all the people? The one who will never be able to afford a flute? Or the one who created the flute? Okay, let's keep that hanging. But this is the part of the question. Now that we're moving from produce to the marketplace and the animal worked hard and the laborer worked hard, who should get who should get uh, what percentage of the cuts on the profits? So when we gather our figurative or literal crops with our own hands, we risk thinking that we deserve to take for ourselves whatever the marketplace offers us for them, right? Should there be regulations? And we might find ourselves forgetting that we must share credit for what we reap with those who helped us grow it. In fact, part of that is God, of course. The whole tithing process is, um, yes, it's, it's economic justice. It's responsibility for the poor to leave 10%, but it's really a gratitude to God. It says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I, yes, I, I, 
I worked hard in the field, but the only reason I was able to um, reap what I sow is because, uh, is because of the gifts you've given me in my life. The fact that I live, the fact that I had rain, the fact that I have this field, the fact that I inherited whatever I inherited. And so I leave this 10% as a sign to say, none of this was mine in the first place. This is all yours. And so I don't give that 10% back. I leave it. I don't even take it to, as a sign that this was never mine. So it's economic justice, but even more, it's a religious, it's a religious orientation. Now, on a philosophical level, we reflect on what it means to gather ideas, me'amar, gather ideas. In reflecting on real-world ethics, real-world ethics, not the realm of just theory, we might consider all the dimensions we need to gather together to get a full picture of the world around us, including principles, context, data, history, perspectives, experiences, dialogue, situation, consequences that define the universe around us. We don't just smack down some abstract principle or law on the table and expect it to give us all the answers. Many people relate to halakha, Jewish law, in such a way. Many people relate to, uh, to ethics in such a way. But rather, Judaism says we need to go through the process of gathering, me'amar, and what we gather will allow us to recognize the multidimensionality of the decisions that face us on a daily basis. This is about moral pragmatism, a holding of resistance to hard absolute theories, as we talked about last session as well. In doing so, we embrace a plurality of values. Rabbi Walter Wurzberger, the late student of, of the Rav, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, writes in his book, Ethics of Responsibility, he writes, the pluralism of Jewish ethics manifests itself in the readiness to operate with a number of independent ethical norms and principles, such as concern for love, justice, truth, and peace. Since they frequently give rise to conflicting obligations, it becomes necessary to rely upon intuitive judgments to resolve the conflict. There is, however, another dimension to the pluralism of Jewish ethics. It is multi-tiered and comprises many strands. It contains not only objective components, such as duties and obligations, but also numerous values and ideals, possessing only subjective validity. Moreover, the pluralistic thrust of Jewish ethics makes it possible to recognize the, legit the, the legitimacy of multi, excuse me, of many alternate, uh, alternate ethical values and ideals. So if we merely followed the newspapers and the Facebook posts, we would get a sense that Torah is about absolutes. Uh, Salam Elohim means human rights, right? And Tikkun Olam means support this legislation. Or, or on the conservative side as well, pro-life, you know, clear because we have a pasuk, we have a verse. But in fact, um, Jewish law and Jewish ethics as a separate enterprise, some people try to conflate the two, um, uh, uh, is far more complex and requires me'amar, a gathering together of a whole lot of data and context and experiences and dialogue and voices in the room, and voices in the room. Um, by the way, I would always say in the Beit Midrash, because the Beit Midrash, at least the ones I grew up in um, as a young adult, were generally um, um, one type of person. And I would always say, okay, if we're going to study Nita for a year, women's menstruation for a year, don't say anything here you wouldn't say if there wasn't a woman here. Or if we're going to talk about Gentiles, don't say something that you wouldn't say if there was a Gentile in the room. You should talk as if, as if of course, it'd be even better if we had all the voices in the room, but we should talk as if everyone is here. So in the, in the process to commit to moral pluralism, however, we run the risk of social chaos when we try to operationalize the moral compasses that set the paths we perceive to be purely on a, theor a theoretical plane. As one example, we know on various levels that we need herd immunity in order to deal with communicable uh, diseases. The population has to agree to immunization for the necessary herd immunity to develop in an optimal fashion. Pluralism sounds nice, but at the end of the day, we need people to be on board. People need to live by a social contract to ensure there's some degree of societal trust and cooperation. So here we engage in organizing. Each of us must gather together all the unique factors to resolve our personal moral dilemmas, but then collectively we need discourse and community organizing, that's community gathering, me'amar, to get aligned on collective issues. We can't merely live in our own private spaces. We embrace a pluralism of live and let live at times and at other times of moral concessions where we must make sacrifices in our commitments for collective consensus and cooperation. And so when we think about the need to gather together the different perspectives that allow for this pluralism, we recognize that each of us only has access to partial truth. God is the infinite kaleidoscope 
holding all the partial truths. Our job is to gather the sparks from all the partial truths to participate in a fuller godly existence. Rav Cook taught that remaining only in one's partial truth is to remain in the dark. We can consider how the gathered pieces of the, of the divine, the kaleidoscopic truth, through the prism of the Jewish holidays. For one, the holiday of Sukkot is referred to as Chag Ha'asif, the feast of the ingathering, the festival of gathering. This refers to the, to the gathering of the harvest, but also recognizes the importance of having our families and communities gather together in celebration. Again, the collective. Related to this word of me'amar is the counting of the omer. These words, of course, share the same root of ayin mem resh. We count the days between Pesach, when barley was gathered together for the omer sacrifice, which was brought to the Beit HaMikdash, to the temple, and Shavuot, another agriculturally significant holiday, which we mark today in part by reading how, um, the reading of how Ruth met Boaz when she was gathering food for herself and for her mother-in-law. So when we count the Omer today, we gather together the weeks that transition our psyche from freedom, represented by Pesach and Yitziat Mitzrayim of the Exodus, to responsibility, which is reflected in, the, in, the, in Matan Torah, the, in the giving of the Torah and Shavuot. Just as during the period of the Omer, when we look to ascend in our spiritual consciousness, our consciousness, so too in our refraining from physical me'amar on Shabbat, we refocus ourselves on gathering together more perspectives to deepen and expand our consciousness. Now the Rambam and the Mor Nevuchim, Maimonides and the Guide for the Perplexed, writes about this idea of the Omer. He says, Shavuot is the time of the giving of the Torah. In order to honor and elevate this day, we count the, the days from the previous festival until it arrives, like someone who is waiting for a loved one to arrive, counting the days, who even counts by the hours, or think of a child counting for their birthday. This is the reason for the counting of the Omer from the day we left Egypt until the day of the giving of the Torah, as this was the ultimate purpose of leaving Egypt. And as it says in Shemot, and I will bring them to me. And so this idea of relationship that comes with the counting or the, or the, the gathering, you count your guests who are coming, you set, the, you set the right number of plates for them to come. Rabbi Arya Carmel also talks about the Omer. He says the Omer on Pesach was from the barley harvest. The offering on Shavuot was from wheat. Barley is mainly food for animals. Wheat is food for human beings. The Torah hints to us the physical independence of itself it's, by itself still leaves man from the Torah perspective on the animal level. The counting of the 49 days signifies a sevenfold refining process and marks our progress to full human status with our acceptance of the Torah at Sinai, seven weeks after the Exodus. By the way, I saw this great idea that, um, you know, it says, let us, make, let us make man in our image. Let us make human beings in our image. You know, B'Tselem Elohim. So who is God talking to? What do you mean, let us? Who's the us? Monotheism. Hello, monotheism. So who is this us? So, you know, there's those who want to talk about the, plura, the, the, the plurality of God within the oneness, like in a Hinduism. Hinduism, if you ask the cab driver, is uh, polytheism. But if you ask the academic Hindu, um, it's a monotheism, um, of course. Okay, lots more to say about that. But also, so too in Kabbalah, there's a plurality to, uh, to God, uh, like a trinity, if you will, or the spherot. There are multiple dimensions, but there's still a oneness uh, holding all of that together. Um, so what am I talking about? Oh, yeah. So, right. So, the, so let us make uh, humans in our image. So one interpretation there is the plurality within the unity. Another interpretation is God is talking to the angels in the Midrash. Let us together the angels. But here, here's the Kiddush, right? Here's the Kiddush. Here's, the, here's the, um, the insight. God is talking to the animals that was just created. God is saying to the animals, let us make humans in our image. That is to say, as the Tanya says, that humans are part animal and part angel, neither of them free. The, an the animal listens only to the animalistic instinct. The angel only submits to the, to the divine call. And the human being has the choice to respond to either the animalistic instinct or to the uh, angelic uh, submissive divine call. And, uh, and so he says this transition from, from Pesach to Shavuot is about this transition from the barley harvest to the wheat such that um, we move from 
the animal experience. Of course, part of Jewish ethics is always trying to distinguish the human uh, from, um, from the non-human animal um, uh, in, in order to elevate the human being in ways that we might find inspiring and in ways we might find uh, problematic. Now the Zohar in Idrasuta on Devarim says this over here. Because of course, the Lagba Omer is also not only about a part of the Omer, but it's a part of the Chilula, Chilula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Rashbi. It's also my wedding anniversary. Maybe many of you also, because the custom is not to get married in those other, uh, in, the, in the other 33 days. And so Lagba Omer, after 33 days of the Omer, is a big wedding celebration. So on the day Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Rashbi was to leave this world, he organized, this is, the, this is the Zohar, he organized his teachings. His friends came to his room and he said to them, now is a time of favor. I can now reveal to you the holy things that have not been revealed until now. All that day, the fire never left his room. The fire, the fire of the Torah. And there, were, and there was no one who was able to approach as the light and the fire were surrounding him. After he passed away and they came to bury him, the fire flew into the air and danced before him. A voice was heard from heaven, a batkol, saying, come and gather every year for the halula, the anniversary of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That this should become a, a gathering time around the fire. That's why we light a fire on Lagba Omer, the, the bonfires, um, to remember this fire. And so too, we're reminded here that the whole enterprise of the Kabbalah, at least on a, on a prescriptive level, is to gather the sparks. The me'emar, that we gather the sparks, right? This is tikkun olam. Right, just the Kabbalah 101 in, in 20 seconds. Shvirat Kalim. There is a break, cosmic break, and the sparks that had that were unified get um, disseminated. And our role in doing mitzvot, in, um, as we understand them as commandments or as good deeds, um, is to spiritually um, elevate those sparks and to reunite um, to reunite those sparks. Tikkun olam, and and by doing such, we repair the world. We repair it not by holding a sign or partially by holding a sign at a rally, tikkun olam, as it's known today. Very important, very important when it comes to life and death matters like uh, mass shootings and economic injustice and things that literally, uh, uh, you know, racism, things that literally uh, diminish the image of God within human beings and, um, and destroy the image of God. But also, too, through meets vote that... Um, that purify ourselves in the world around us and thus elevate those sparks, we bring a tikkun, we bring a tikkun olam. So, okay, one more, one more thing from Hasidut here, um, which is from the Baal HaTanya, the Baal HaTanya from Likutei Torah. It says over here, the Baal HaTanya, of course, is the Alter Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, the first uh, Chabad, the Chabad Rebbe, nothing like uh, Chabad as we know it today, but still there's a continuity there. Uh, well, I guess there is, a, there is a lot in common, because if Chabadnik wants to engage someone, they always want to study Tanya. They don't want to study Halakha. They don't want to study Talmud. They want to study Tanya. So like the Tanya is like a Bible. It's like a Bible in the Chabad world, so to speak. So here's what it says over there. But in order to get to this high level, one must count the counting of the Omer. This is what it means, count 50 days, that the contemplation of the greatness of the infinite one, Kadesh Baruch Hu, is 49 different aspects, which are alluded to in the verse, to you, God, are the greatness which are the seven midot of the upper world of Atzilut. Each one of them in turn is made up of seven, totaling 49. The 50th gate is the upper gate, which includes all the aspects and everything in this is contained within the 49 aspects, which are united to a single unity. Okay, so over there also, we see this climbing process, this climbing process um, of, of, of an ascent, that in gathering, we're not, it's not merely um, an egalitarian gathering. It is also a hierarchical gathering of an ascent, an ascent. So it holds on to both of those, that horizontal image and that vertical, that vertical image. Okay. On the level of global justice, we can also pull out and see the fuller human experience shared by individuals who gather together, make up humanity, which collectively faces bundles of challenges. The Midrash says, I think about this all the time from Shemot Rabbah, Exodus Rabbah. If all of the suffering and pain in the world were gathered on one side of a scale and poverty was on the other side of the scale, poverty would outweigh them all. Now, that's, there's a lot to Midrash to, say, to offer on that, a lot of commentary to say, really? All the suffering is equal to poverty? Um, what is that about? Okay, so let's, let's leave that as an open question. 
this idea of gathering together not only this notion of ethics, but on this notion of human experience of suffering. Indeed, when we gather the evidence at large, we can refocus ourselves to the largest moral problems. This is also true on an existential level. When we reflect on life and death, consider how the book of Genesis, Bereshit, refers to the death of the three patriarchs, the Avot, as a gathering to one's people. Ve'ye asef. It says three times over there, by Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Ve'ye asef. And Avraham, it says over there in Genesis 25, 8, and Avraham breathed his last his last breath, dying at a good ripe old age and contented, and he was gathered to his ancestors, i.e. those who are deceased. Um, some will say gathered, to, you know, in mourning by those alive. Some will say this is talking about afterlife. Yitzchak, over there in Bereshit 35, 29, he, Yitzchak, was gathered to his kin in ripe old age. And then Yaakov, Bereshit 49, 33, to end the book of Genesis, when Yaakov finished his instructions to his sons, famously, he drew his feet into the bed, breathed his last breath, breathing his last, and he was gathered to his people. Okay, so a different word here of asif, asif, aleph, samech, fe, um, for the same idea of memar, of gathering. Actually, another word, a very common word for gathering, kibbutz. Think about it, kibbutz, leak boats. That um, if you think about the kibbutz, the, the great Jewish enterprise of early Israeli socialism, of gathering together the collective um, uh, for farms, for living. You know, if you go back, uh, you know, the, the children's houses, you know, I mean, my life, if I didn't have children next to me at night crying for my wife to nurse them or for me to hold my ear or whatever they want to do in the middle of the night, um, they'd be in the children's house, sleeping in the children's house um, and playing in the children's house. Uh, so anyways, the kibbutz also this notion of, of or, or kibbutz goliot, the, the gathering of the, of the exiles, the gathering of the exiles, this, this pulling together. Actually, we just saw a few days ago the, the new aliyah from the Ethiopians, uh, e Ethiopian Jews who just, uh, who just uh, were part of kibbutz goliot, return back to the land. Okay, last thought, and then we're going to open it up. In this world, we gather together as families and, a, and as communities. We gather together ideas and information, and in death, we return to our ancestors and are gathered together by them and with them. And as those still on earth and in mourning, we gather to remember. And so me'amar, we refrain um, on whatever level we refrain on Shabbat from some notion of gathering in order that we can reflect on a richer ethical deliberation that we don't just have some trope that people have today of follow your gut or be a Kantian, <laughs> right, or, or via Haftarach HaKamocha, love your fellow like yourself, that we actually can't just have a phrase or one principle, that each thing that matters to us, each relationship, each ethical deliberation um, is very complicated and um, requires us to pause and reflect. Um, and so too, um, on a spiritual level, we gather the sparks. Um, around us to elevate those sparks. So thank you, Hevra. Th 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 that's my opening introduction here. Um, and I'd love to open up uh, the floor. D don't forget to unmute yourself for questions, thoughts, disagreements, and the like. Um, maybe you have to all be unmuted and then mute yourself again. Shmuley. Uh yes. It's Mona Fishbane. I, I wanted to, I, this is a beautiful teaching, and I'm thinking about that there's a lot of complexity in the gathering, all the kinds of gatherings you've been addressing, um, and it's our capacity to hold the complexity that's so important. You know, at some level, we want to just make things simple, and we go by our, our beliefs in a non-complex way, but you're really talking about holding complexity both within us and also between people and spiritually. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Exactly. Holding complexity. Um, and in fact, it's very troubling. It's very troubling. Let's say I'm, I, I follow Peter Singer on global poverty, and I say I have to make real sacrifices in my life so that I can support people in Africa. Um, okay, beautiful. I'm going to make a sacrifice. I'm going to support them. But then all these economists push back, and they say, okay, so let's take Singer's analogy. There's someone dr dr um, um, drowning in the river, and I have to pay $100 to cross the bridge. I have to cross the bridge for $100. 
and then I can jump in the river and save the person drowning. New, if you're a moral person, of course you pay the $100. That life is worth $100. But then the economists will push back, the philosophers will push back, say, what if the gatekeeper you're paying the $100 to is, um, is a corrupt tyrant and is going to use that $100 for more weapons and kill children? And he says, that's the reality of global aid. Um, many ascribe to this theory that actually we're doing more harm than good when we donate to certain African countries in certain ways, or in most ways even, that we're supporting corrupt tyrants who then um, oppress masses. And so that's really difficult. Now, how do I think about global aid towards, towards those, those who are hungry, those who need access to, to clean water and access to health? And so the complexity of any relationship or any moral dilemma um, is actually uh, is very heavy. And, uh, and we have to make a choice if we want to live with that complexity or not. Um, because for some people, vacation means simplicity. I don't have to think. But thinking doesn't have to be suffering, right? The, uh, embracing complexity of thought and life doesn't have to be uh, suffering. It's true for some, it can be. The idea of still wrestling with a decision is suffering. How can we still be wrestling with this? We've been wrestling this for months. I just want to be done with it so I can feel, I can feel whole. But in fact, um, complexity can add richness to our life as well. Someone else. Are people able to unmute themselves? Don't forget to unmute yourself if you're going to share. Hi, Shuli, uh, Shmuley, uh, Neil Comas Daniels. How are you? Hey. Shalom, shalom. Um, good. How are you? That was gorgeous. That was beautiful. Um, uh, one, uh, do we ever get the text that you use? I mean, can we ever? Oh, you know, we get reference to them. You know what? I, we should let's start including them in the slideshow. Okay. That way, we that way we can read it. Or if you prefer, if you actually want to have it rather than just see it. Yeah, I'd like to. Think about how to include it. it. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Let's okay, so that's one thing. the The second thing is, is, is it sort of gets to a a notion that I've had for a very long time is that is that um, you know that that Shabbat frees us from certain work so that we can do other work on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got we have a, a whole. We have a whole um, uh, agenda on Shabbat yes. uh, that, you know, we don't do the physical gathering on Shabbat, but we're mandated in a sense mm -hmm. to do the other gathering so that we're ready to do that work during the week. Yes. <laughs> right. I love that, Rabbi. Thank you. Um, and, you know, it's interesting for some of us, um, we might actually want to make a to-do list or, as I said earlier, a to-be list. Um, on, on Shabbat, and that might be empowering. We're going to save our best meals. We're going to save our nap. We're going to save a book we love to read or an article. That we're going to save a conversation with our life partner or with a child. We're going to save something special and create an agenda. And some of us might feel like we live by such a, a time orientation already. We don't want an agenda. And that work, so to speak, is going to emerge more organically. We're going to operate by, by time um, the other days of the week, but then we're going to have a freedom from time, a freedom from, from time on Shabbat. But I think you're exactly right that this idea is not just prohibitions of what not to do because doing these things is bad, but actually a freedom to do other types of, of uh, creative, uh, uh, engage in another creative enterprise. Thank you, Rabbi, for that. Thank you so much. Yeah. In fact, your work, uh, your work itself on, um, on um, gun violence, um, I think is very relevant here. Uh, your heroic work on that um, and and other work, um, which has helped us uh, helped us to understand uh, the importance of thinking about Shabbat and the stuff that we have and how we think about safety uh, and responsibility. I have this note from the chat that said, "This is from Steve, and he wrote a musical chord as another kind of gathering, quote unquote, made up of distinctly beautiful components called notes." Mm. I love that. I love that. That is so amazing. That is so amazing. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So I would, I would offer something. This is Andrea Luna here. I'm in mean, North, yeah. North Coast, California. Uh, thank you so much, Reb Shmuley. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking a little bit on the uh, complexity of uh, responding to the needs of the community. That was beautiful of um, evoking the holidays in Sukkot and the gathering, the in-gathering. Um, even though we're all struggling with the larger and incredibly complex 
issues globally, <laughs> where the climate change is still happening. And in the United States, the uprising and Black Lives Matter and the violence is being perpetrated on protesters. In our own small communities, I'm a member of a very, very small community in um, Mendocino, California, dealing with the emotional impact of uh, the uh, sheltering in place and COVID is very challenging. You know, um, just providing meals and Bikr Haleen to our residents is the easy part of it. But dealing with the loneliness that comes up, mm -hmm. um, gives, uh, it, it, it's a very complex challenge of what our responsibility is and, um, and what are our personal boundaries of how much we can do while still taking care of ourselves. So I think that um, struggling with these social issues is um, there's no uh, easy answer sometimes, even in the microcosm in these uh, very small communities in our, you know, personal community, face-to-face -face community now on Zoom of how to, how to take care of each other in these yeah. challenging yeah. times. Yes, I love that. And I'm not going to, uh, Andrea, Andrea, thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm not going to say much other than just um, elevate the importance of the question that you're exactly right. Our moral responsibility to socially distance, but also our moral responsibility in response to loneliness, which is very, very serious. And as more being discussed, there's being discussed more and more loneliness as a mental he health crisis um, and understanding the dimensions there. And I would say that there's both the moral component to lo loneliness in terms of how we relate to others that we care about um, and, and to ourselves. And then there's also the spiritual dimension, which we wouldn't advise another on, but we can reflect on ourselves. The Piagetsna Rebbe, um, the Piagetsna Rebbe, uh, who of course was orphaned and then died in the Shoah and has this beautiful theology that emerges from the Holocaust, um, writes about distinguishing between atzvut and shvirat halev. The atzvut is sadness, and it's disjunctive. It, 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 it breaks us, it divides us from others. It, it, it does, it's not generative. Shvira Talev, the breaking of heart is, is conjunctive. It brings us closer together. It elevates us, it brings us closer to God. And so each exp emotional experience has the potential to be elevated and be constructive or be destructive. Um, and this idea of, of anger, which can be destructive, one of the most destructive emotions, um, but also can be generative of righteous indignation that, f that furthers us to work towards the good. So too, loneliness can bring us closer in existential despair, if you will, towards Kodesh Baruch Hu and towards uh, a deeper depth within ourself, um, as can be found in Tehillim and Psalms uh, by David Melech. Um, and it can be destructive. So I just want to elevate the importance of your, of your question there. Thank you your reflection. Someone else, please. I guess I, I really appreciated, Rabbi Shmuley, how you frame the complexity and the tension. There's such a tension in dealing negotiating the moral issues you, you know there's the old saying gathering opinions to determine justice if if uh four wolves and a lamb have a vote on what's for dinner the lamb loses out mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. it's so difficult when you try to think democratically about it how to negotiate a social contract and um I don't know, do you have some guidance on how to navigate this kind of thing? Because uh, uh, how, you know, justice can't always be imposed, and yet there's, I don't know, d democratic process doesn't always work either. Uh, what's the, how do you navigate that? You know, I would love to throw that question back to the group, Stan. It's a really great question. Um, and just to kind of, to put, um, to put three binary, uh, I was going to say three binaries, but that makes no sense. Um, three, three ideas along that spectrum out there, just uh, and then I'll open it up. We have the notion of, uh, of the monarch. We have the notion that, um, you know what, B let's bracket this complexity and let's just have some control. And so let's have one person calling the shots. Then you have something like the Greek philosophers who think, basically, we've got some smart people. And then we got the masses. Let's, got, let, let's let the smart people make some decisions here because um, you know, the elitists are the ones who are educated enough to really know what to decide here. And then you have, and of course there's many other spots along the spectrum, 
the, I guess, the, the most pure notion of democracy, that you don't need to be educated, um, that really you need to give the power back to the people and the masses. And even if, like you said with the lamb, only 51% agree, or in fact, even 30% agree, uh, if you look at an Israeli parliament system as compared to a two-party system, uh, you might have only a quarter or a third who want something. Um, or, or, <laughs> um, or actually, if you look at the electoral system in America also, you, you can have below a majority, of course, as well, um, in various levels. But let me throw the question back to the group. How do, we, um, how, how do we think about this idea? Now, when it comes to a communal decision, it's very different than when you're talking about a society. How do you think about the just society in regards to um, what happens to the minority opinion? If, if I can use um, the pandemic as um, yeah. an example. So as a Canadian, uh, and, and I'm sorry for keep bringing this up, but the two countries are as different as can be. I see that here our leaders um, go to the experts and the majority of people go to the experts. So there is no political movement of I won't wear a mask, it's not freedom and all that. I mean, to people like that, I always say, do you wear clothes in the street? Why? You know, there has to be some sejo. And, and I think like democracy only by the masses would be out of chaos in a disaster. Then again, um, if you have a cruel tyrant, that's also not a good way. But but almost, you know, like, I don't know how to explain it. But really, really, you need a democracy that also includes the experts and um, in really, really serious matters. Look at the experts, look at the economists who really, really know and uh, not just some rich dude who's using the system to make himself rich. So that's my comment on, on uh, that kind of thing. So if you're looking at gathering, it's gathering the expertise mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to help make decisions which should be made by the government, but the government represents the people so that when you have your vote, you're voting for your representative but, and it's up to that representative until the next election to make the decision. Um, but it's not up to each and every person because that's just chaos. Right, so we have, we have this, we have this, thank you, Lauren. We have this chaos right now around the democratization of knowledge where it used to be you went to a doctor and you trusted the doctor, but now people um, do research and they find out various options and they might not choose what their doctor advises, right? Um, or, um, or, 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 or so too, you know, we call the, the most popular rabbi today is Rabbi Google, right? That people actually Google their Jewish question. Um, but in fact, um, w one of the ways I like to talk about the role of a rabbi is actually providing something that Google can't, right? Because you're going to get a very limited um, and, uh, uh, response from Google. I mean, a very expansive response as well. But um, also, you're going to lose a lot of the context in the background. So there's a beautiful, beautiful thing to the democratization of knowledge, that people have access to, uh, to data. And that should be the case. And this is one of the problems in the pandemic, that people find out, are they in a hot spot or not? And because they're not in a hot spot, they say, oh, I can go about life as usual. But then it becomes a hot spot, right? So, um, uh, I, or in, in, the, in the Jewish world, people often say, don't give access to the real halacha because then people will do that. It's got to be guarded. There's got to be fences around it um, because then people will break through that next, that next layer. I'm a big advocate of transparency and giving the knowledge to the people, but there's a problem. There's a problem. And so too, in an era today where people read headlines more than articles, we can't expect that everyone is gonna engage in a process of critical thinking. Now that of course doesn't mean we should censor knowledge, but it means we have a problem of how in a world where the average person will not engage in critical thinking and will not read an article in full, do we ensure that expertise is valued? And one of the ways I think about religion is about persuasion, not legislation. We don't wanna make our religious values into law in Israel or in America or anywhere. Um, we want to use our values to persuade society. And how do, we, how do we think about society in such a way that we don't just want to advocate for new laws, although we may want that as well, but we also want to persuade the cultural discourse. 
and highlight and amplify voices of, of reason and of expertise. But anyways, I, I want to step back again um, because Lauren added to that, and I want to and I want to return to this question that Stan raised as well: how we think about democracy and the gathering of ideas while still ensuring that we have a reasonable society. Uh, Ira hey, here. Yes, Professor hey, Tyson. hey, Shmuley. Thank, thanks so much for this uh, uh, wonderful teaching. This is such a fantastic series, uh, truly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so I, uh, you know, obviously it's a big question of political philosophy. It's a great question, and I have uh, uh, no insight into it that fits in less than a book. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I do I, I do want to kind of reflect back one of the pieces of. Uh, of what you're sharing today that I think helps us engage the question, maybe in a way that's a little bit less immediate or, or bitter than we sometimes get, um, speaking for, certainly for myself here, um, which is when you're calling us to think of Amr in terms of uh, the harvest, in terms of counting Omer, in terms of the cyclical pattern of our engagement with the living world, um, that part of what we're thinking about then too, when we approach democratizing, uh, democratizing individual spaces, democratizing knowledge, democratizing so-called democracies, um, part of what we have to be thinking about is a cyclical process. And so that part of what I take your teaching today to be asking us to kind of use Shabbos for uh, is as a space to attune to the ways in which gathering is an ongoing process and it's repeated every harvest season. It's repeated over and over and over and so too with our political or ethical processes. I'll just say this and, and, then, and then be quiet, but one of the things I was thinking about a lot as you're talking is, uh, of course, Levinas's ethics, um, the ethics of infinite obligation, isn't just an infinite obligation to the face of the other, it's all of the other others implied by the face of the other. And so there's an infinity of obligation in the face-to-face -face relation and there's an there's a larger infinity of obligation in the relation with the third with all of the other others mm -hmm. and it's that it's that tension between my infinite obligation in the face-to-face -face relation and this larger ever more infinite obligation to all of the other others that has somehow to be practically worked out and i love the idea of the working out of that as a cyclical harvest style gathering that has to be accomplished mm -hmm. over and over and over for the maintenance and increase of life. So th thank you so much for that. Thank you for that. And you know, this, this, um, I appreciate that. And I want to off offer two reflections off, off of that. One is, you know, Levinas at the Mabul, at the flood story, you know, it says over there in Genesis that, um, um, well, it really in the, in the, in the Midrash, uh, that uh, that Noah Noah is running to the doors of the ark, trying to open it because he finally realizes that everyone is flooded, everyone is drowning, and so he's trying to open it, and God won't let him open those open those doors. Um, and um, and Levinas says over there um, that never again will the infinite uh, make infinite obligation finite. Um, such that um, that we're not able to open the doors. Now that's kind of a loaded and, and um, uh, 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 a uh, you know uh, really really kind of a loaded way to think of it. Um, and in fact, we see that a number of times where people are not able to save. That's also the case when Lot's wife looks back at stone and turns to salt. What's the first time that anyone in the Torah is allowed to look at suffering? Right? Noah's not allowed to look. He's not allowed to open the gates to see the drowning. Lot's wife is not allowed to look back at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but is the drowning of the Egyptians in the sea, um, where they look back and then it says they sang a song and then they're rebuked. How dare you sing a song at the drowning of your enemy? Um, and, and I would suggest that it's only that once we are a collective, we've been gathered to be a nation, that we're able to look at the suffering because then we can actually respond. An individual alone can't respond to the suffering of the masses. You need, you need a collective. And so that Levinas, that move from interpersonal ethics of the other to the move of justice of the third, of the collective, is such a, is such a profound move where we're stuck. And that's why um, you know, we're stuck um, 
in, um, in thinking of our plurality of values and then thinking of the just society. And what, what um, Professor Allen is suggesting here, the cyclical na uh, nature, which is built into the holidays and the annual cycle, but also into this, uh, this process. Something I want to reflect on here is the importance, and push back if you disagree, of not destroying the other argument. Or no, let, let me rephrase that. Not destroying the virtue that is hidden within the other argument of the opposition. Because of the cyclical nature of societies, and let me expand that a little bit. I am on the side that thinks, uh, I'm not on the anti-masker side, um, the side that rages to have to wear a mask. You might not be surprised by that. Um, I'm on the side that says, okay, okay, liberty of the individual, very important. Collective of the well-being, more important in this moment. Okay, now, but I don't want to squash the virtuous desire for the, um, the liberty of the individual. Um, I could, you know, there's many cases where I'm going to come out in the collective well-being side. Immunizations, I generally think people should get vaccinations. Good idea to get vaccinated. I understand it's really intrusive to you and to your child to have to get this vaccine, but I think it's good that we have this herd immunization. Okay, but I can imagine another case. Someone says, okay, collective well-being. Everyone's going to bow down and accept Jesus Christ as their savior. Okay, bad idea. Let's, let, you know, let's have freedom of religion. Let's have the freedom of minorities to embrace, with it, you know, embrace it as they choose. So what I want to say here is we should, in, in the debate, the marketplace of ideas, we should um, squash the anti-masker idea that, um, that people have a right to breathe on other people. Um, um, and yet, we should uphold in that marketplace of ideas the virtue, and that's where we can embrace the pluralism, where we, we, there's an absolutism we can embrace as to why our side should be right and should be legislated, um, and yet the plurality that we can hold up the hidden virtue within the opposition side as having validity, just being misapplied. And so the cyclical nature that's being emphasized here, yes, in another, in another um, model of government or another um, you know, government in place in this country, we could imagine the flip side where we were holding the liberty of the individual. In fact, the whole notion of Tselem Elohim, that there's an image of God, actually is about upholding the individual's dignity and rights at the expense of the tyranny of the masses. Um, and so, um, so yes. So I think the cyclical no notion of, of, of uh, democratization is to say there's a whole bunch of values we want to keep alive. And in this current configuration, this, um, you know, we're going to emphasize this approach. But in another configuration, in a, in a different moral dilemma, we might um, have a different uh, model to uphold as we gather together um, the data in that, in that moment. Okay, so I want to read N Nona's, uh, Nona Siegel's point over here and then open up the floor again. We only have 10 minutes left. When the experts in a society do not represent the society fully, such as so few people of color, women, LGBTQ+, in the scientific, economic, medical community, then the, excuse me, the expertise is limited. People then do not trust the expertise and look elsewhere using their own knowing. A huge issue now as the prevailing structures do not respect other points of view and the conversation is set up as adversarial and distrusting. Democracy depends on justice as a foundation. Good, okay, thank you for that. Because uh, you're exactly right that we might think democracy means um, that minorities have an equal say um, because their voice is also empowered. And actually there's a whole bunch of barriers um, in democracy uh, to minorities' voices being heard and being empowered. Um, and so there can be a false sense of, of, um, of freedom. And so, um, yes, as Iris said over there, the democratization of democracies, to constantly, democracy is almost like something we yearn for but never fully achieve, um, this, um, so, you know, such a freedom. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and it might actually be that we are not even close to putting together the, the model yet. Um, that, that would be a true democracy. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's open it up for a few more questions and thoughts. I would like to, I would like to respond again. This is, um, it's always so very interesting to be discussing um, philosophical models of democracy, looking at history and bring it into the present. But I wanted to touch on something uh, that uh, was just mentioned by the Rav uh, about on the balance of all the suffering of the world and poverty being uh, having the most weight and one thing that this crisis we're in has made so um, glaringly clear 
is the situation with frontline workers, at least in this country, who are often uh, Black or Latinx, uh, low pay, the uh, rates of COVID. In our community, they're only 30% of the population, 50% of COVID, poor housing. It's um, uh, shining a light on the poverty that exists. So maybe that's a place to start in developing these structures of the ideal um, 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 you know, society, just to start with doing something about that poverty, um, rearranging the balance of wealth, getting rid of those tax breaks right. or whatever it is, and taking care of that problem, and maybe the rest of it will fall into place. Um, I think we have some real problems that need some real nitty gritty solutions. And it's wonderful to develop a philosophical and intellectual um, idea or structure, but we have to start from the grounds up with some of these uh, crises that we're dealing yeah, with. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, um, love Bernie Sanders, hate Bernie Sanders, just to reflect on that mo moment in American history, which has passed, uh, some would say is still very, very alive. Um, his argument, um, well, you know, there, and there's this whole debate around, is it identity politics or is it economic justice, right? That, that ought to be first and foremost. But his argument, um, first and foremost, <clears throat> which is that we can't do anything until we address economic injustice, um, was his approach. That while there is deep, deep poverty, um, nothing else, because uh, everything is, it flows from there and is interconnected from there. Um, and so whether we're dealing with, um, you know, issues of health, issues of education, issues of happiness, issues of um, societal progress or the like, um, that poverty, you can't buy your way out of uh, many problems, like you're talking about with farm workers. And so um, there are many problems which are not related, well, I shouldn't say not related to, health, to, to, to wealth at all. I was going to say mental illness. If you're depressed, you're depressed. But actually, um, there are, you, know, you can access therapy if you have the financial means. You can access medication. You can access community. You can access less time from work. There's a whole bunch of ways you can manage something like depression or anxiety more if you have means. And yet there's still the human experience of mental illness that, that, that is equal. Nonetheless, I think that what is the Midrash is saying over there, and Andrea, I appreciate you circling us back to it, is that, um, that m most human predicaments are, um, can be mitigated to some degree with wealth. Um, and poverty means you can't navigate those human predicaments, those suffering at all. And so poverty exacerbates any form of other suffering. Um, now, um, okay, more to say there, but in, in our last six minutes, I want to open the floor again. Uh, um, so what, one thought that occurs to me relating to, um, to uh, some comments that were made a few minutes ago, has to do with the, the tension, um, I guess it is, between the idea that there is um, a, a need for um, a democracy of ideas, recognition of uh, the, uh, the need to, to gather together the, the, the thoughts and perspectives of um, uh, minorities and majoritarian views and to, to give them as equal weight as possible. But that uh, needs to be balanced on some level against the need to, um, to recognize that things have to get done. And to use a Bismarckian term of phrase, um, politics is the art of the possible. So you have um, recognizing discrete um, individual perspectives but the need to, to merge them in order to, to, to get things done on some level. Love it. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, what moves us from the realm of philosophy to politics is exactly that, the need to get stuff done. So Judd, thank you for that. And in general, for all your feedback um, in this series, behind the scenes and, um, and on the scene. <laughs> but yeah, but, but yeah I, I actually want to return to that idea at another time, the, the, the art of the possible. Um, and I think that it, one, I think one of the great roles we can play um, as Jews is adding a richer layer um, to the tapestry of American political discourse. Um, yes, there's Democrats and there's Republicans, there's liberals and progressives, and, and, you know, and all of that is very, uh, uh, provides great opportunities and enormous division. But I think that um, the philosophical layer and the Jewish layer that can be added to whatever our political orientation is to add more complexity, 
um, to, uh, to that, del uh, that deliberation and more dignity to the process is just enormous. So thank you. And so how do we, and this is the Talmudic process, hold on to the, the minority view, take a majoritarian approach, um, dream of the art of the possible, and yet also get stuff done. And the Talmudic approach to hold on to those minority views and even continue to wrestle with them, but also move forward the discourse um, uh, towards, um, you know, is, uh, is very meaningful. Okay, one more, one more, one more voice. Okay, so Me'amar. Um, we'll conclude with Memar, our session number four. It feels like it's been more than four. So, <laughs> but thank you. I'm very grateful to you all who have been joining this and offering thoughts and feedback in the chat or sharing. Um, and um, this notion of gathering we have explored, um, which may have seemed purely agricultural, um, and yet we're trying to expl explore from a Kabbalistic perspective of gathering sparks, an ethical perspective of gathering the complexity uh, that's involved, um, a holiday perspective of gathering together of people, a community organizing perspective of gathering together various different voices, a democratization of knowledge and how we think of, of gathering together expertise, gathering together masses, um, gathering together the, the art of what's possible, and yet also getting stuff done. At the end of the day, we want to bake the bread. We want to bake the bread. We want to gather stuff together. And so we, we, we step back on Shabbat to rethink about our process of gathering. How are we using labor to gather for us? How are we using our own hands to gather? How are we using our own internal complexity, spiritually and intellectually, to gather together and to hold together that tapestry of, um, of, of complexity? to how we uh, make our moral deliberations. I give us all the bracha of Me'amar this, um, this coming Shabbat, and it's connected to Omer, Pesach to Shavuot. We have a ways till Pesach, I don't wanna freak anyone out. <laughs> but this process of counting the Omer and thinking of that not only as a gathering in a egalitarian sense, but in the, um, in, in the, uh, in the um, a vertical sense of, of ascending, um, of gathering together to kind of build a ladder, if you will, to climb higher and higher. Give you all the bracha, and I hope you'll give it back. Wishing everyone a beautiful Tuesday, and see you again soon for session five. Dash, dash next week. Session five. Shalom, shalom.